Hi there, and welcome to Module 5 of the Open Science MOOC on Open Research Software and Open Source. This module has been developed in the open through collaboration by an international team of open source experts. Everything you see here has been developed in the open through interactive feedback and collaboration from the wider community. It comprises a series of videos, infographics, simple text-based reading, and a little practical task for you to sink your teeth into, as well as, of course, this audio version. Don't forget that you can join in the discussions uh, at our open Slack channel too, and please don't forget to introduce yourself and tell us a bit about who you are, your background, and how you ended up here. So this module is designed primarily for computational researchers at the graduate and undergraduate level, as well as any budding data scientists and other researchers who use analytical code or software. In a modern day research environment, this actually covers pretty much anyone who uses a computer for their work. So software and technology underpin much of modern research, which is now almost inevitably computational in one way or another. Think search engines, social networking platforms, analytical software, and even digital publishing. With this, there is an ever-increasing demand for more sophisticated open source software, matched by an increasing willingness for researchers to openly collaborate on new tools. The power of open source is in that it lowers the barriers to collaboration and adoption, therefore allowing ideas and technology to spread more rapidly. This module will introduce the necessary tools required for transforming software into something that can be openly accessed and reused by others. There are some specific learning objectives for this module. This includes learning the characteristics of open source software and understanding the ethical, legal, economic and research impact arguments for and against open source software, as well as to further understand the quality requirements of open code. It also includes being able to turn code made for personal use into open code which is accessible by others and the ability to use software and tools that utilize open content and encourages wider collaboration. So what is open source software? Virtually all modern scientific research workflows rely on a range of software tools, either operating on different data sets with different parameters and applied iteratively in various ways, also known as data science, or operating on different inputs and using models and methods to predict some output state, also known as computational science. Open source software is computer software in which the full source code is available and under a specific license that enables others to, other users to access, view, modify and redistribute that code for any purpose. Because open source software requires such a license, it typically remains free of charge by default. This explicit licensing is also what differentiates open source software from free software. Reusing open source software for analysis, simulation, and visualization for research is also typically easier and more flexible compared to proprietary software. Often, whether we know it or not, we are already using open source software as part of our own research workflows. Now, open source software, or OSS, fits into the broader scheme of open science as it helps to make the full research environment, including the software that produce the re research results, fully accessible and reusable. As such, it forms a necessary component for the best practices and repeatability and reproducibility of research, both by yourself and by others, along with other components as well, such as sharing data. In some cases, sharing of source code can even be conditional for the acceptance of associated research manuscripts. It is also perceived generally to increase your research impact. Some of the common advantages for software developers include increased developer loyalty and empowerment, lower costs of services and marketing, increased branding of services and products, production of high quality software at a lower expense, flexibility and rapid innovation, customization and module integration, increased reliability and independence, and based on open standards being available to everyone. As such, the main advantage for researchers, both as producers and users, includes lower costs, increased transparency, increased security and stability, and no vendor lock-in with increased user control and an overall higher quality. Furthermore, sharing OSS allows researchers to receive credit for their efforts, for example, through direct software citation. Commonly used OSS include Mozilla Firefox, the internet browser, as well as the LibreOffice full office suite. LibreOffice is similar to the popular Microsoft Office, including a word processor, spreadsheet manager, and slide presentation software, but is completely free and open source. Some even regard the open source movement to represent a counter movement to neoliberalization and privatization through defiance of regulations and norms in the construction and reuse of information and a potential transformation 
of modern day capitalism through making software ab abundantly available with minimal effort. For more on this, see the free and open source software movement, Resistance or Change by Panayota Georgopoulou for more on this topic. Now, the commonly accepted principles of open source software have been defined by the Open Source Initiative, who are one of the pioneers of, the, of open source software. The definition is fairly complex, but it can be briefly summarized as making software as reusable as possible for future works while also being freely available. Now, there are a number of existing platforms and tools that support open source software and collaboration. The Open Science Training Handbook provides a checklist to use for evaluating the openness of existing research software based on the open source definition from the OSI. So for example, is the software available to download and install? Can the software easily be installed on different platforms? Does the software have conditions on the use of it? Is the source code available for inspection? And is the full history of the source code available for inspection through a publicly available version history? Other dependencies of the software, including the hardware, also describe properly, and do these dependencies require only a reasonable, minimal amount of effort to obtain and use? When you make open source software, or when you're looking for it, just simply make sure that it checks these simple criteria, and then you're done. Now, what about the open source community and its governance? There are sort of two main camps within the free software community. There's the free software movement and the open source software movement. Both have different ideologies based on user liberties and the practical implications of software. Often, the term FLOSS, F-L-O-S-S, -S, is used to reconcile these two political, ca political camps. and means free or libre and open source software, libre being French and Spanish for free in the context of freedom. The core principle of reuse is what separates OSS from free software. Free and open source software is an inclusive term to describe software that can be both classified as free and open source. A good example of uh, free and open source software is the Ubuntu Linux operating system. The big difference between free software and OSS is that the former must distribute updated versions under the same license as the original, whereas newer versions of OSS can be distributed under different licenses. FOSS Free and open source software combines the best of both worlds. These definitions have now become widely adopted both by international governments as well as some large organizations such as the Mozilla Foundation and the Wikimedia Foundation. Major, major organizations in the FLOSS space include the UK Software Sustainability Institute who produce valuable resources such as the recent software deposit guidance for researchers. For individual open source software projects, there are typically three main formal roles the maintainer, the contributor, and the committer. A maintainer is a user with commit access to implement suggested changes to the project. They have the responsibility for the direction and improvement of the whole project. A contributor is someone who directly adds value to the project through issue resolution, code writing, or even external activities such as communications and event organization. A committer is someone who can make commits to the project. And for more on this, see the first task as part of this module. Typically, roles are made public through either the README file, a contributors file, or a separate team page for the project itself. More on this later. So, existing platforms and tools for open source software. Virtual environments and machines are becoming increasingly popular as high-powered research workflow enablers, and many of these are built upon OSS. For example, operating systems, programming languages, and even data processing frameworks. Popular services include Google Cloud and Amazon Web Services, which also assist with database storage and content delivery, as well as computational power. Inside DNA is a computational platform for reproducible research in bioinformatics, genomics, and the life sciences. So as we mentioned before, LibreOffice provides an open source alternative to Microsoft Office. The two are almost completely compatible, just with a different uh, default file format. For citation managers, Zotero is the most popular open source alternative to proprietary platforms such as Mendeley or EndNote. Zotero uses the BibTeX format, based on LaTeX, and has browser plugins to make citation management simple. It even actually integrated recently with Google Docs, which is very useful for researchers. By also integrating with other software such as LibreOffice, it is now possible to have a fully open source research workflow in many cases. Now, we want to talk a little bit about GitHub now. So did you know that this entire project was built as an open and collaborative community effort 
inside of GitHub. But what is it exactly? So GitHub is a popular hosting site for both software and non-software content, often called notebooks. But with added capabilities for version control, project management and tracking, and storage services, GitHub is built on top of the open source software Git, which enables users to work remotely and maintain, share, and collaborate on research software and other non-software based projects. Version control is essentially a process that takes snapshot, snapshots of the files in a repository and tracks modifications to them. It records when the changes were made, what they were, and who did them. If several people are working on one file at once and any overlapping changes are detected, these must be resolved prior to, to continuing. Overall, this provides a much more streamlined and automated process than manually saving and recording changes as projects develop. It also helps to avoid the inevitable list of confusing named file versions, which I'm sure we've all experienced if we've ever written a research paper. Now, one of the most popular and useful functions of GitHub is the issue tracker, which is used to organize open source software development. Each module of this MOOC has its own separate issue tracker, and this contains a history of things that people thought could be improved, uh, general comments, as well as like any additions or contributions to improve the content of this module. Now, other similar project hosting services also include Bitbucket or GitLab and Launchpad. If the recent acquisition of GitHub by Microsoft is a bit off-putting to you, then these represent really great alternatives. However, we also know that GitHub can have quite a high learning curve, which is why the first practical task for this MOOC will hopefully teach you how to set up your first GitHub project repo, and you can find that online. So what about open source software used in common research fields? So especially in uh, modern scientific research, OSS usage and development has become practically the norm. There are a number of reasons for this beyond those that apply to the general acceptance of open source software, for example, by consumers, industry or governments. Um, some of these main reasons include the fact that increasingly algorithms implemented in analysis software form an integral part of the methods sections described in scholarly publications. This means it's completely at odds with rigorous peer review if these algorithm sort of implementations are close to outside inspection. Scientific collaboration more often than not spans multiple institutions and distributed research networks where secrecy and command hierarchy is not maintained in a way that is necessary for closed source development. Uh, many computational analyses are also now run in virtualized environments, such as institutional, national, or international cloud infrastructures, and these are hosted on multi-user servers. Closed source commercial software often disallows such usage. Now, open source software development also often relies on volunteers, and in a time of budgetary constraints for scientific research, it has a clear advantage here. Um, for these main reasons, as well as others, open source tools are now very commonly used in scientific research. This includes usage in fields where many researchers are amateur developers themselves and rely on tools such as R for statistical analysis and scripting, which in the last decade has almost completely displaced commercial software for statistical analysis, such as SPSS or GMP in a lot of fields. In other fields such as bioinformatics, uh, you know, fields that involve a lot of file handling of the outputs, you know, for example, of DNA sequencing platforms, general purpose scripting languages such as Python and commonly used libraries built on top of this, such as BioPython, have become a vital part of the toolkit for many researchers. These tools such as R and Python are essentially software for writing more software. Although programming is becoming an increasingly common activity among many researchers, of course, not everyone does this. So one step away from programming is the chaining together of the inputs and outputs of various analysis tools from longer research workflows. For example, in genomics, a very common workflow is to start out with a high throughput sequencing reads and then, first of all, do basic quality control checks. Secondly, map the reads against a reference genome. Thirdly, identify the points where the new data are at variance with the reference. Now, each of these steps are routinely executed as a workflow where a different open source executable is run in a Linux command line environment for each of the three steps. Although this is arguably not quite open source software development, it does involve the usage and production of open source artifacts, such as Linux shell scripts, for which the principles that we discuss in this module are very much applicable. 
Lastly, open source software is also used in scientific research for reasons that more closely mirror those that drive the adoption of open source software in wider society, namely that it's cheap. For example, individuals or organizations might decide to switch from Microsoft Office to LibreOffice for manuscript writing or spreadsheet processing, because the latter is free, both as in free beer and free speech. Likewise, the choice to switch from, for example, ArcGIS to QGIS for the analysis of geographic information might be prompted simply by cost considerations. Now, the most likely person who might want to reuse your software in the future is you. So while sharing is always better than not sharing, you can make your own life and that of others much easier through appropriate documentation. Now, documentation can include several things, such as including helpful comments and annotations in the code that help to explain why a particular action was performed rather than what is it intended to achieve. One of the most critical aspects of this is including an informative readme file that accompanies almost every single open source software project, and sometimes even more than one. It can be good practice to include one such file in every directory that includes a list of files, a table of contents, and what the purpose of that directory is. The readme file is typically just a plain text or markdown file, such as again for this MOOC, and can include critical information for how to install and run software, previous dependencies and requirements, as well as things like tutorials or examples. So, fun fact, the term readme is sometimes playfully ascribed to the famous scene in Lewis Carroll's Alice Adventures in Wonderland, in which Alice confronts the magic munchies label with eat me and drink me, so, you know, potent. Um, however, the purpose of the readme file is to provide sufficient information to maximize the reuse and reproducibility of the computational environment, such that someone with no experience with the project can easily access and reuse the software. By lowering the barriers to entry, you increase the chances of others being able to reuse your work, which is one of the ultimate goals of open source software and even research itself. An extension of this that can help to make things even easier for future reuse is container technology. So containers are like an ecosystem frozen in time, where the code, the data, and any other dependencies are all perfectly preserved, packaged, and saved in the present functioning versions. This means that anyone in the future can come in and run your analyses again. As such, they are really good uh, generally for reuse, but this can come at the sacrifice of modification or understanding by others, as often a lot of details can be hidden within the source code and its dependencies. So common examples of container implementation in research include Rocker, which is a Docker container for the R language, as well as Binder and CodeOcean. Uh, ultimately, these are all about sustainable software, which is just good software. Now, in 2013, Sanve et al. came up with 10 simple rules for making computational research more reproducible. So these are, one, for every result, keep track of how it was produced. Two, avoid manual data manipulation steps. Three, archive the exact versions of all external programs used. Four, version control all custom scripts. Five, record all intermediate results when possible and in standardized formats. Six, for analyses that include randomness, note the underlying random seeds. 7. Always store raw data behind plots. 8. Generate hierarchical analysis output, allowing layers of increased detail to be inspected. 9. Provide contextual statements to underlying results. And 10. Provide public access to all scripts, runs, and results. If you follow these steps, hopefully along with the processes in task 1 and 2 for this module, you should be fine when it comes to open source research. Now to move on to a little bit to open source licensing. Uh, an open source license is a type of license that is designed specifically for software and code and that make it explicit what the legal conditions for sharing and reuse are. As we discussed above, the addition of a suitable license is what differentiates publicly shared software from open source software. For example, the widely used MATLAB is proprietary software and Octave is an openly licensed alternative programming language. There are currently more than 1400 unique open source licenses, a complexity born from a difficulty and understanding the differences between the legal implications across different licenses. However, some of the more common ones include the Berkeley Software Distribution License, Apache Licensing, the MIT Style License, or the GNU General Public License, GPL. You don't need to learn all of the legal gritty behind all of these, but it's good to at least know what options are available to you. There are sort of two ways in which contributions to a project can become licensed. 
The first of these is explicitly, whereby each individual contribution has a clearly indicated license independent of the main project, or implicitly, where the contribution falls under the original licensing code of the main project. Thankfully though, the process of selecting an open source license is relatively trivial, thanks to user-friendly tools such as Choose a License. Each of these licenses allows others to use, copy, distribute, and build upon your own work, often while ensuring that the creators are appropriately recognized for their work. Here, the key is selecting an appropriate license for your work, depending on what you, you want or do not want others to do with it. Software citation forms an important part of OSS2. So, citations provide one of the most important interactions in scholarly research, often forming the basis as well of our referencing and metric systems. Typically, this is performed thanks to the assistance of a, u a permanent unique identifier, such as a digital object identifier, or DOI. A DOI is a persistent identifier implemented in the handle system that meets a common standard depending on the purpose, such as for identifying academic information. Such identification is critical for tracking the genealogy and provenance of research, for reproducibility, as well as for giving appropriate credit to those who have created the software. Importantly, software should be considered legitimate output from scholarly research, and citation is becoming an increasingly common way to indicate that. In 2016, Smith et al. wrote a paper uh, about the principles of software citation as part of the Force 11 Software Citation Working Group. In the same way that you would want to cite software that you have used as part of good research, research practices, it is also important to make your research easily citable too. When citing any software that you've used for your own research, you should include at a minimum the author name or names, the software title, the version number, and the unique identifier or locator, such as the DOI or URL. The six principles of software citation by Smith et al. are importance, credit and attribution, unique identification, persistence, accessibility, and specificity. For more on software citation, you can check out the Smith et al. paper, as well as the, the task accompanying this module on how to link GitHub with Zenodo. Uh, a bit more on that for now though. So as we mentioned before, GitHub is a popular tool for project management, content storage, and version control. Um, we should note though that GitHub itself is not open source software, but Git, the tool which it is based upon, is. So Git itself is designed to help manage the source code files and the updates to them for any software related project. However, it can also be extended to non-software projects, you know, for example, like this MOOC. However, getting research onto GitHub is just the first step. It is equally important to make it persistent and reusable, which is why having a DOI associated with it can be really useful. The simplest way to do this is through a service called Zenodo, which is a free and open source multidisciplinary repository created by OpenAir and CERN and it can be used to assign DOIs to individual GitHub repositories. There is a GitHub guide that explains the details which involve linking GitHub repositories directly through to Zenodo, so that when developers create formal releases for their software, Zenodo creates and archives a version of that software. So there's nothing special about using Zenodo for creating DOIs, other than the fact that it's free of costs. So other general repositories can also be used, such as Datasite DOI Fabrica, your own institutional repositories, such as those operated by Caltech. Now, a lot of researchers might typically be afraid of sharing code, which is considered to be incomplete or buggy or imperfect. However, in the open source software community, such a practice of sharing, you know, the sort of raw code is actually fairly commonplace. Sharing code openly enables others to reuse and improve it, as well as to engage in a deeper way with any research associated with it. This is one of the fundamental aspects of peer-to-peer -peer collaboration and perhaps exam best exemplified by the traditional process of research manuscript peer review. Um, to learn more about this, go and check out the uh, guide for the process of linking your GitHub repositories to Zenodo for archiving. It should be noted as well that all of the material produced for this MOOC is available and part of an open science MOOC community in Zenodo itself. So you can go and check and cite all of the content that we've made for this MOOC if you wish. Now, a final note on collaborating and contributing through open source. So often OSS is developed in a public, decentralized, collaborative manner between multiple contributors. The purpose of this is to enhance the diversity and scope of project and its design in order to become more beneficial and sustainable. Such an approach was famously likened to a bizarre model by Eric Raymond, an early open source software proponent. 
One of the major guiding principles is that of peer production, which relies on self-organized communities to regulate the development of content coordinated towards a shared goal or outcome. So OSS projects typically rely heavily on volunteer collaboration, which often entails a constant flux of newcomers in order to become productive and sustainable. Creating the right social atmosphere for a project and a welcoming engagement environment are often critical to successful collaborations in open source software. Right, so that's basically it. Um, where do you have to go from here? Well, hopefully now you've come to see the importance of software as a cornerstone of modern science and the importance that open source software in particular plays in this. If you've completed uh, you know, the text and the tasks for this module, then the learning outcomes from this should be that Firstly, you will now be able to define the characteristics of open source software and some of the ethical, legal, economic and research impact arguments for and against it. Secondly, based on community standards, you will now be able to describe the quality requirements of sharing and reusing open code. Thirdly, you will now be able to use a range of research tools that utilize open source software, and you might have been already. Uh, you will now also be able to transform code designed for your own personal use into code that is accessible and reusable by others. And finally, software developers and researchers themselves will be able to make their software citable and software users will know how to cite the software that they use. Now, hopefully you've also completed the first two tasks alongside this. The first one was how to set up your first GitHub repository. And the second one was how to link these repositories with Zenodo. However, we also have a bonus task for you if you've completed these. So task three is a little bit of a step deeper uh, into integrating Git into a typical research workflow by showing you how to integrate it with RStudio. Um, before you progress with this one, we do recommend that you've completed the first two tasks before proceeding with this one, just because it'll make it a little bit easier for you. However, your open source journey does also not have to stop just here. Hopefully, this is just the beginning for you, and there are some incredible resources out there if you would like to do or learn more. So if you feel particularly inspired by this module, you can endorse the Science Code Manifesto, which is based on the five principles of code, copyright, citation, credit, and curation. If you want to launch and develop your own project, the Open Source Guides program offers a range of practical guides and skills to help you launch and advance your own open source software project. For a detailed look at OSS-based research workflows, the Open Science, Open Data and Open Source Hand Guide by Pedro Fernandez and Rutger Voss is one of the best resources out there online. Um, more formalized journal venues also exist for software-based articles, including the Journal of Open Research Software and the Journal of Open Source Software. The PLOS Open Source Toolkit provides a global forum for open source hardware and software research and applications. The NumFocus is a non-profit organization that supports and promotes world-class, innovative, open-source scientific software. Now, some of the projects they sponsor include IPython and the Jupyter Notebooks initiatives, RopenSci, which promotes the open-source R statistical environment for transparent and reproducible research, and to gain more hands-on experience with open-source software, the Software Carpentry community holds regular workshops to improve lab-based computing skills. So finally, I'd just like to thank the development team for this module, including Alex Morley, Kevin Merman, and Rutger Voss, the three open sorcerers, Tanya Allard, the open sorceress, Simon Wellington, the book liberationist, Paola Masuso, aka Open Source Batman, Ivo Grigorov, aka Open Source Robin, and I'm John Tennant, the dinosaur whisperer, and thank you for listening to this module. We hope that you've enjoyed it and you found it a valuable part of your open science journey, and we hope to see you on the rest of the modules for this MOOC. So ciao for now.